quite yet. Uh, but, um, you know, we all know increasingly how important sleep is, and we're yeah. being told that more and more. Yeah. And uh, it, people don't realise how direct that link is between sleep and weight gain or weight yeah. gain. I wonder if you could explain. Yeah, absolutely. So lots of people have heard, particularly, you know, in more recent years, sleep has come to the fore and lots of people are aware, yeah, it has a profound impact on my physical health or my mental health. But actually, when I tell my patients that sleep is so fundamental to your weight control, they're like, wow, I wasn't expecting to hear that. So what happens is when you are sleep deprived, you develop this kind of what I call in the book a hormone storm, which is highly pro weight gain. Because you're sleep deprived, you haven't had enough sleep, you haven't had that recharge and that boost and all the things that are supposed to happen overnight when you're asleep. But the next day you still need to wake up and function and walk and talk and do your work and so on. So first off, your body releases this hormone called cortisol, which is a stress hormone. Now we all need to release a bit of cortisol every morning to give us a bit of a jump start. but then cortisol levels should fall when we're well slept. If we're sleep deprived, cortisol levels tend to run high. And I'm going to, the way I sort of explain cortisol in the book is this, cortisol is a steroid. Anyone listening, anyone viewing who has ever taken steroid tablets for conditions like asthma will know that steroids tend to be associated with weight gain. So that cortisol boost, that stress hormone boost you're relying on when you're sleep deprived to keep you going. So yes, it keeps you going and doing your work and doing your thing, but it's also, you will put on weight as the sort of, you know, no such thing as a free lunch. The other thing that happens, we come back to insulin resistance, which we talked about with the grandma and the bread example. We're more resistant to insulin. So your body needs to produce more insulin, the fat controllers, whatever food you're eating. And so you're in a pro weight gain state. And lastly, the hunger hormone ghrelin, that runs really, really high the next day after sleep deprivation. So, you know, people watching might recognize, yeah, when I'm sleep deprived, I cannot satiate my appetite. I'm like hoovering up food and I'm never satisfied. And that's because ghrelin, the hunger hormone from the stomach is running really high. And ultimately it will push us towards, you know, unwise food choices, food choices that aren't good for our weight control or for improving our health. So you're in this kind of perfect hormone storm. The good news is that it's completely in our control to calm the storm, to find a port in the storm. And that means getting a great night's sleep. And when you prioritize your sleep, and what I say is, you know, if you have young children or you've ever looked after young children, you know how, how important their bedtime is to them. And you have this routine and you say, you've got to go to bed because you know you want them to be well slept the next day. So give yourself that same self-care. You know? So make your bedtime, make your sleep really important. Calm that weight gain hormone storm of sleep deprivation. And so many of my patients find that such a powerful part of their weight loss journey. I think I'm going to start asking some of these questions. Ooh, please. They're really um, good questions, as always, from the How To audience. And many of them um, are things that you do bring up in the book. But I'm yeah. sure a lot of people will, might want to know this because you um, mentioned it's OK for a vegetarian this this diet and people yeah. have eat lots of delicious recipes. Yeah. But um, Charles said, what recommendations you would have to offer for an overweight vegan? Um, and just generally, I think people would might, uh, there are other questions about how it um, would, would work if you were a vegan. Yeah, very, very good question. And I can answer that from experience because I have patients who are vegans, uh, either for ethical reasons or religious reasons or a combination of the two. Um, so I think the answer is stick with the core principles. So, um, you're, you're, you know, so, so Charles might have come across that vegan is obviously um, really the zeitgeist. And so the food industry are, are, are there for you. And so really, really, really important, as, as I'm sure your, your, your vegan uh, viewers know, is just make sure that what you're eating is not ultra processed. So all those claims of plant based health and all that sort of stuff, just check that those dubious ingredients that we talked about have not snuck in. So, so, so important. So we're sticking with the principles here. We're saying no ultra processed food or limit it as much as you can, because whatever way you're eating vegan or non vegan, that is not going to feel good for your body. Second principle, let's keep the blood sugar really nice and stable. So if you're vegan, so yes, you're not going to be having the animal products, the dairy, the eggs, meat, fish. So we're going to have to supplement that with other things that don't spike the blood glucose. So things like a bit more tofu, soy-based products, um, vamp up those vegetables. Um, there are, you know, there are absolutely ways that you can do this. And non-dairy alternatives 
which have absolutely proliferated in recent years really add to our choices. Because if you find things like, a, like an oat milk or an almond milk with really straightforward ingredients, same for other dairy alternatives, they will be really helpful um, and you know, just make sure that they are straightforward products. So I can promise you that doing this, you do not have to be meat-based or animal product-based, and I've got lots of patients who aren't. Lots of us are choosing to be more plant-based, even if we have the odd bit of meat. There are tons and tons of vegan and uh, vegetarian recipes. Um, and um, I, I think that's, uh, I think it's, it's definitely possible. So rest assured is the answer. Just keep your glucose stable and away from, away from those ultra processed foods and you feel good. I'm going to ask these two together because there's a similar um, theme to them, I, I suppose, about mood um, and, and eating for the sake of it rather than because you're hungry. So Alex says, do you have tips for people with ADD for whom overeating is sometimes a result of a need for a dopamine hit rather than genuine hunger? Yeah. An anonymous attendee says, since the pandemic, I've been eating because I'm bored. Yeah. Depressed rather than hungry. Different questions, but similar, similarish sort of theme, I suppose, because the theme here is I'm eating, but I'm not biologically hungry. And that is just such an important point. And I, I, I sort of devote at least two chapters to that. So you asked Hannah, how is this book different? You said it's revolutionary. And, you know, um, one of the reasons it's different is because I do this. This is my thing. This is my specialism in a, in a clinical setting. I know that you can't just give people food advice or exercise advice or sleep advice. And so here it is, here's the advice, you know, why don't you get on and do it? Because um, that's not how human beings work. Because if you have a book that's purely, let's say about, you know, change this, change this one thing you're eating or this one way of eating and all will be well, I, I, don't, I don't see over time that's sustainable with my patient group. I think many people watching will agree as, the two questioners have, have, have pointed out. So here's the question, you know, what do I do about eating when I'm not hungry? First thing is to recognize it. So amazing that your two questioners have recognized it. For some people that self-awareness takes a bit more time. And then the question, the first question was about the dopamine hit. So I'm not hungry, but I need a boost. There are certain foods that are engineered to give us that dopamine boost. So just to orientate people, we have a part of the brain called the reward center. And that's the sort of pleasure part of the brain. So that if we do things like eat uh, a chocolate bar or we gamble or we're on social media, we get lots of likes, we get that dopamine boost and it feels great, but it's very, very fleeting. And so then we need to do more and more of that thing, more and more social media, more gambling, more chocolate bars to get that boost again and again and again. And so the answer really to the dopamine question is, it's quite hard to be in control of those behaviors, whether it's chocolate or whether it's social media or whatever it is that you're very reliant on to get that dopamine boost. Because ultimately you sort of need more and more to get less and less, if that makes sense. And so many of my patients who first come and are really, they're kind of really frightened. They say, I've got no control over my eating. They actually find that when they step back from the foods that are driving that search for that elusive dopamine hit, they take back control of their eating, some of who feel they've been out of control for years. All of us will have different trigger foods and it's the, the important thing is to recognize what that, what that food is. The second really key piece of advice is about with emotional eating, often we are filling up an emptiness that's not to do with lack of food because the gut is a kind of second brain. We can go into that if you want to, but the gut, is a second brain, which is why we feel a lot of emotions in our gut. And so we are driven to sort of eat, to often squash or suppress difficult or upsetting emotions. And the techniques I use with my patients is first to, under, to, to, to recognize I'm not, I am not physically empty, I'm emotionally empty. I've got emotional hunger. And then to work out how do I fill myself up without eating? It's a really, really key question. And everybody's answer is going to be very, very different. So some of my patients get really, really into exercise. And so in the evening, instead of eating, if they've had a long or difficult day, they go out for a, a cycle ride or a walk. Some of my patients fill themselves up by calling someone who they know always makes them feel good or you know, texting someone who always says something nice, like it's so nice to hear from you. And then you feel really full. 
The best way to describe that fullness is if you've ever had a time in your life when you're so excited and you're so buzzing, maybe the day you get married or something like that, food tends to be the last thing on your mind because you are so full, you're so emotionally full that you're not really thinking about eating. Now we can't get married every day, but we can <laughs> fill ourselves up in a way that doesn't involve food. And it's really a sort of journey and a sort of some introspection to work out what that looks like for you. Um, very, very, of course, um, helpful. There's so many questions for you. I don't think I've ever seen so many questions. Um, well, Ginny, I'm going to answer you very quickly. The book title is The Full Diet. You missed, the, you missed it, The Revolutionary New Way to Achieve Lasting Weight Loss. And um, I think that uh, another question that I uh, you answer in the book in, in your mm. important chapter about the windows. Yes. The window. Yep. So is the question that somebody asks, what is the science behind fasting for 16 hours? Mm. Um, so you don't directly call it that, but you do talk about closing and opening your eating. Yes. So perhaps you could explain. Of course. That. So, and it's a really good point. Why don't I just call it fasting? So, so, your, so, 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 our, so our viewers who, who have read the book will know I call it the eating window and I can explain why. I don't call it fasting because I think that's really off-putting. It sounds kind of like, oh, is this really going to hurt? And I'm going to be really hungry. And, um, and that's not the case. So I kind of steer away from the word fasting because it doesn't have the sort of most kind of friendly or, you know, exciting, um, uh, you know, overtones. So what is the evidence for not eating for 16 hours and then eating for for, for eight hours and that's the eating window I open my window at a certain point might be 11 a.m or 12 p.m and I have eight hours which I can eat when my window is open you can choose your own timings you close your window then I'm choosing not to eat for let's say 16 hours but you can adjust that make it slightly longer slightly shorter what works for you your schedule most importantly when am I hungry so I'm never prescriptive to my patients that I don't know when their ghrelin hunger signal from their stomach is strong some people say I can't face food in the morning. Other people say I wake up ravenous. So you've got to listen to your body every single time. And also, what's your schedule? What are your family up to? What are your, you know, what are, what are the timings of your day that are important to you? So you work out your timings. Now, what is the evidence for 16 hours closed, not eating, eight hours open? Well, there's very, very good evidence for having a period of time when there is no incoming food, both for weight loss and for your overall health. Our bodies were simply not designed to be eating food from seven o'clock in the morning when we wake up until 11 o'clock at night when we go to bed. And you might think that's a total exaggeration. Nobody eats from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. But actually sometimes when I go through the day with my patients, you find that there are eating opportunities so regularly, right through to having some snacks when you're watching TV in the evening when you go to bed, you're like, whoa, that was, that was 16 hours of eating. Your body just kind of can't cope because your body has to have time to do other stuff like repair and heal and it can only do that when you're not metabolizing and digesting that's the first thing in terms of your overall good health but let's think about weight loss when you eat even when you eat full diet food you will release a little bit of insulin to deal with that rise in blood sugar so when you decide i'm going to have a period of time like 16 hours uh, when i'm not eating you're going to be running low insulin levels because you've got no rise in your blood sugar to contend with. So when your insulin levels are running low, when you're choosing not to eat, that is the signal to your fat to A, not fat store, great, I'm out of fat storage mode, but B, to break down and lose weight. And since a lot of those 16 hours are when you're asleep, you are fat burning from your duvet. How great is that? Did, did the questioner specifically want to know why 16 hours? Why not 18 hours or 14 hours? Or, or no, they ask, we're asking, as I think we've answered really, what the science is. General point. Yeah. 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 Um, so I think a lot of people are...